Okay, so it is what? Thursday the 29th, unbelievable, of May. And this represents the last lecture uh, material for the first exam in Biology 106. Uh, we'll be finishing up the special census today. Now, the exam will be next Tuesday. That exam will cover, and I know this, the syllabus is wrong. Uh, it does not, the syllabus does not mention chapter... The syllabus says that the first exam covers 12, 14, 15, 16. That's wrong. It should be 24, 12, 14, 16. So get rid of the 15 and make that a 24, okay? Uh, in the order that we did it, though, we started off with 24. That was water balance and, and electrolyte balance. And then 12 was the axon and the action potentials. 14 was the brain and parts of the brain sleeping and cranial nerves. And 16, now we're looking at the senses. We finished up. Uh, we went through a little bit on touch. We went through smell and taste and we got almost through hearing. And I'm gonna pick up with hearing, and then we still have balance and vision to examine today. I know I'll get through that material. So our exam will be over those chapters, right? 24, water balance, 12, nervous system, neuron, action potentials, 14 on the brain and sleep waves, and 16 over the senses. Any questions you can think of right now as far as content on the exam? There will be one, the exam is largely multiple choice. There are 100, I believe 125 multiple choice questions on the exam. There will be one written question, one short answer question. It'll be worth 15 points. So it's worth roughly 10% of the overall grade. And I'll tell you right now that it's dealing with action potentials. So make sure you can trace out and write out an action potential, what the graph means, the depolarizing, the repolarizing, that kind of thing. Make sure you understand the local versus action potentials, what the difference is in local versus action potentials. And you understand the importance of the axon hillock and the trigger zone in initiating a uh, action potential. And you would also want to make sure you understand or include in your response uh, EPSPs versus IPSPs, right? So an excited, excitatory versus inhibitory uh, potentials. Okay, so that'll be, a, that'll be the only written portion on the exam. The rest of it will be short answer, or uh, sorry, multiple choice. Question? Chapter 24 is included on the exam. Replace 15 with 24 on the syllabus. Okay, so that was a typo on the syllabus. Um, 15 is not, 24 is. Okay. So we've had a total of six lectures. Uh, honestly, this is probably the longest period of time before we have an exam ever again. I mean, we're three weeks into the course. We're now a fourth of the way through the content. It's unbelievable. We're going to have five exams, and they're all going to well, and they're all going to come right in the next uh, nine weeks. And so we typically will only have about two weeks between exams. Now, the exam will be all that we'll do next Tuesday. So you'll have the entire period, uh, two hours to do the exam. I don't think you'll need that much time, but there won't be a lecture after it. So once you're done on Tuesday, you are done. Questions for me? Is the exam going to be here? Or is it exam, thank you. The exam is going to be in the blue and gold room. I'll send out an email about that. The blue and gold room is in sort of the middle of the campus. Uh, next to the student union area, down from the blue light area. I'll send out a, a, a message about that. Thank you for reminding me, though. We will have not only the 60 of you, but also the, some of the hybrid students joining us. And so th there'll be more than this room can handle. So we'll be in the blue and gold room for the exam. And again, thank you. I'll send out a reminder about that. OK, uh, well, we, we're, we're talking about the senses, and I, and I, I hope that you have a basic understanding of the senses, that every sense requires a receptor, right? And that receptor is specially located somewhere on your body or in multiple places, and that each receptor has a modality that is something that turns that particular sense on, right? Turns on the receptor. And then uh, something happens such that an action potential is sent, isn't it? 
And so there's an action potential that runs down that nerve. Now, all of the special senses are the cranial nerves, right? So everything we've talked about as far as special senses involve the cranial nerves. Uh, general sense, that is of touch, is largely your skeletal nerves, but there are, you know, there is some sensation of, of feeling on your face. Uh, in, in fact, what, what cranial nerve gives you sensation of feeling touch on your, in your head? What nerve is going to allow you to feel in three areas of your face? Trigeminal, right? Tri, three areas, right? So that's the trigeminal. But most of your sensation of feeling is coming from your spinal nerves. Okay. And then that, that action potential is going to go somewhere into the central nervous system. And we learned that most senses have how many neurons involved? Three, right? The first neuron typically does what? Goes from the external place, whatever turned it on, and goes, if it's touch, goes to the spinal cord. Let's go ahead and just do that thinking. So the first sensation, it's a, it's a touch receptor, and it comes in and goes to the spinal cord. And then what? In fact, where in the spinal cord? More specifically, in the dorsal horn. And then what happens? The second order neuron picks that up and synapses with that and goes where? up to the thalamus. Now, it's going to cross over at some place, typically right there when it's coming to touch. It's going to cross over right there at the gray commissure at that level of the spinal cord. It's going to travel up to the thalamus. And then in the thalamus, there'll be a third order neuron, which will send that signal from the thalamus to the sensory strip most often, right? Sensation, that sensory strip. Now, if it's dealing with um, taste, OK? What do we have? The seventh or ninth nerve right? uh, picks up what kind of re receptors do we have for taste? Chemoreceptors, right? And there's sodium and glucose and hydrogen ions, different kind of ions that give us different sensations of taste. And those ions are going to trigger those chemoreceptors. And where is that signal going? Look back in your notes. What's the pathway for taste? You go from the tongue, from the chemoreceptors, in your taste buds to part of it's going to go to the amygdala, right? It's going to inform your emotions. What else? Where does it ultimately end up? What, what, what part of your brain is ultimately receiving a, a good part of your sensation of taste? Orbital frontal cortex, which is just a region of the frontal lobe, okay? How about smell? Olfactory nerve, triggered by chemicals once again. And then what? Where is it going? Is it going to go to the thalamus? No. No, smell is the one thing that doesn't go to the thalamus, but it's going to go where? It's definitely going to inform your amygdala for emotions. It's definitely going to go partially to your the olfactory cortex, which is where? It's in the temporal lobe, part of the insula as well. And where else is it going to go? Smell is also going to help you formulate some of your, or help elicit some memory. So your hippocampus will be involved, right? What about, um, what else we haven't talked about? How about well, let's talk about hearing. Okay, let's go on and think about the pathway for hearing. And that's where we are now, picking up this conversation with slide 65. Okay, and these are called the projection pathways. What is it, you know, what, what's the pathway that these signals travel? Last time we discussed the ear overall. We know that sound waves come in. They are going to vibrate on the tympanic membrane. The human ear can hear waves in what range? What, fre what frequency range? From 20 to 220 up to 20,000 hertz. And that is that those waves can be coming in at 20 to 20,000 cycles per second. And they're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. That information is going to be transduced through the three ossicles 
the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. That vibrational information is then going to go in or through the oval window and head into the cochlea where there are hair cells on the basilar membrane that are going to vibrate in response to that, aren't they? Now, at the very beginning of the cochlea, is it easier or harder to vibrate the membrane? As the waves first come in, let me go back. As the waves first come in to the cochlea, and here the cochlea has been stretched out into a straight line, is it easier or harder to vibrate the basilar membrane at the beginning, at the proximal area? Harder. Harder. Because at the beginning, it requires what? In order to wiggle the basilar membrane at the beginning of the cochlea, it requires a wave that has a higher or stronger or more frequent wave, right? Higher frequencies are going to wiggle. And clearly, as you go further down in the cochlea, it gets easier and easier, right? That's how I think about it. It gets easier and easier to, to vibrate that membrane such that we can start vibrating the membrane with a wave that is of a lower frequency. So at the front end of the cochlea, the waves will be a higher frequency that can wave the basilar membrane. Now what happens when the basilar membrane is, is shaken? Those hair cells will bend, right? And the bending of those will do uh, opening of channels, which will then depolarize and send a signal through the eighth cranial nerve. Okay, all making, starting to make sense a little bit? Big ideas? Now, what is the pathway? How does, once the sound waves come in and, and jostle the basilar membrane and the hair cells, what happens? Well, there are going to be, right, these hair cells at the base of these hair cells um, and, and again, this is part of the cochlear nerve. Now, you'll see different verbiage for this in different books, but the cochlear nerve or the cochlear branch is what you'll see more often nowadays. The cochlear branch will meet up with the vestibular branch to create the entire vestibular cochlear nerve known as the eighth cranial nerve. And what we're going to see here is that each ear is sending signals, assuming normal, normal hearing. So you've got two receptors, right? That's all you've got. You've got two ears. And they're receiving these signals. And they're going to send signals first to the pons. OK? So that's the first order neuron. It's going, the eighth cranial nerve is sending that signal to the pons. Now, that's called the cochlear nuclei. Again, this word nuclei means what? A group of cell bodies, right? So what's happening at that group of cell bodies? What's happening at a nucleus? What's happening on those somas, on those cell bodies? Am I hearing synapse? Right, that's the whole idea, right? These neurons are, these nerves are coming in and they're synapsing onto a bunch of cell bodies, right, in these areas called nuclei. So within the pons, there is the uh, cochlear nuclei and it's there that we're going to synapse with the second order neurons, and they're going to go to this area called the superior olivary nucleus. Again, it's just another cluster of cell bodies, it has a name, superior olivary nucleus, and those are actually going to send some signals back to the cochlea, and these are involved with some tuning, if you will, of the hearing. Now, you have two ears, so most of us have by binaural hearing, meaning we have, you know, both of our auricles are picking up signals, and we're going to see that it's here that um, in, the, in the superior olivary nucleus is where we kind of figure out, is that signal coming more from the left or from the right? Those fibers are going to then ascend to the inferior colliculi. I'll show you that in a moment, and this is also going to help us locate where everything's going. Then there's a third order neuron starting from the inferior colliculi to the thalamus. And finally, this is different. In hearing, there's not three, but four. Okay, so hearing's pretty complex. There's a fourth neuron going on. And the fourth neuron then completes the pathway going from the thalamus, which we're accustomed to, to the cortex. And where is that primary auditory cortex? When you hear hearing, you should think what part of the brain? 
temporal, right? So the temporal lobe is, is the one which has the primary auditory cortex. In other words, what part of the cortex is largely involved with hearing? So again, we're looking in the superior top, the top portion of the temporal lobe, and that's where your conscious perception of sound comes from. Remember that everything in the cortex is going to be conscious, so you become conscious of the sound. Right? Um, now, there's a lot of decussation going on, which means what? Decussation is a fancy word for crossing. crossing over. So there's a lot of decussation going on, so that means that you could have damage to left or right auditory cortex, but not have a complete loss of hearing. Again, there's a lot of um, overlap or redundancy, if you want to think of it that way. Another way of thinking about it, there's a lot of plasticity. So if you were to have damage to your auditory cortex, because there is so much crossing over of the pathways, you would still have some sense of hearing from the other side. Okay? You haven't destroyed your ear. Right? You've just destroyed part of the brain that receives it. Does that make sense? So as long as your ears are both okay, if you damage part of the temporal lobe, you would still have hearing from both ears. Okay? That would be perceived. Okay. So let's look at our little diagram here, sort of like a little circuit board. So let's start off um, up here. Let's go right here. Here's our eighth cranial nerve down in the bottom left. There's the cochlea. And let's go with outward signals. So the eighth cranial nerve, that's the primary neuron. It's going to go to, I told you, the cochlear nucleus, nuclei, plural, left and right. It's found in the pons. That then will synapse, and we have our second order neuron. It's going to go up to what's called the inferior colliculus. Okay. Oops, I missed one. That's my bad. So I skipped right over this. This was the superior olivary nucleus, so that's our first one. These are all very short distances, to be honest. And I told you that from that uh, superior olivary nucleus, there's some feedback. So this is the feedback coming back that helps with sort of tuning and sort of fine-tuning the hearing reflex. This is also where the tympanic reflex comes from. Now, I mentioned two uh, muscles that were involved with the tympanic reflex. Reflexes are things that help us, right, save us from damage. And so with a loud noise, if you're approaching a, a concert or something that's loud, there were two muscles that could come to help you in that time. So that's part of that reflex. What were those two muscles? They're listed here for us. The tensor tympani, right? What's a tympani in, in orchestra? The big drums, right? So imagine that big eardrum, right? That big drum. And it tenses, right? It, it tenses up the tympani. So it just kind of makes it more difficult to vibrate, right? The other muscle is the stapedius. And the stapedius is going to pull back on the stapes and not allow as much of that energy into the oval window, into the nerve part of the ear. So then the signal continues up. It goes to the inferior caniculus, colliculus, sorry, and then from here, then third order going to the thalamus, and then finally fourth order going to the superior margin of the temporal lobe, which is where your primary auditory cortex is found. Now, there's also some other things going on. From, from here, from the colliculus, you also have signals going over to help turn your head. Right? I, I, I want to hear it better. So you might instinctively just turn your head right, to hear a sound better left or right. So some of that fine-tuning that our body does, it's voluntary, and yet it's almost involuntary in a way, isn't it? Because we, we will almost instinctively turn our head to hear a sound better if we hear it. So it is a voluntary thing. It is going to the neck muscles. So tell me... What might those neck muscles be? Give me a couple of ideas. I know we haven't gotten to muscles for next week, but what might be some neck muscles involved with turning your head? The sternocleidomastoid, the SCM, or the maybe, maybe a little bit of the trapezius, right? And what do we know? There's a cranial nerve involved here. What cranial nerve is involved with shrugging your shoulders and turning your head? Number 
11, the axillary nerve, right? Right? Or sorry. Accessory. Accessory. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. accessory nerve, right? Not axillary. That'd be we're close to the right area of the body, right? Right? The accessory nerve. Okay, so again, we have a lot of stuff going on here in the auditory. Uh, now look at it from a different way. That was more of a circuit board. Now let's take a look at this from a structural standpoint. So again, the cochlea coming in, there's the first nerve, right? The eighth nerve, that's the, the primary nerve, first order nerve. And it goes to this little area called the cochlear nucle nucleus, which is in the pons. It then travels a very short distance over to the olivary nucleus, the superior olivary nucleus. And then it goes up to the inferior colliculus. Now I realize that those are two words that we haven't had you identify structurally, and that's okay. Um, you don't have to identify, I won't say, oh, is that little nucleus, is that the superior olivary nucleus, or is that the inferior colliculus? I wouldn't ask you to do that, but at least have an idea of this order. And then we go right up by the thalamus. Well, what else is up there in the thalamus? What, what other, quote, system is up next to the thalamus? I'm hearing, am I hearing limbic? Right? So again, is, is hearing going to influence your emotions and your memory? Right? Are we going to buy, are we going to go up near the thalamus? Absolutely. And then finally, this is the fourth order neuron, right? Fourth order neuron that comes out to that superior edge of the temporal lobe. So that's your auditory projection pathway. That's hearing. Anything on hearing? Touch? Taste or smell? Okay, let's move on to equilibrium. Okay, your coordination, your balance, all of that that's put into, into uh, together, and not exclusively, but a large part of your balance, your equilibrium, does come from the inner ear, um, from information traveling down also the eighth cranial nerve, and this is coming from the vestibular apparatus. Specifically, those are the three semicircular canals found in each ear, as well as two chambers, one called the saccule, the other called the utricle. Now, the semicircular ducts, the semicircular canals, are responsible for giving your body information about your angular changes. So as you change angles, spinning your head, that's all your semicircular canals. The utricle and the saccule are more involved with linear acceleration, so not turning, but just going straight or up and down in an elevator. Uh, some of those linear type things, not so much angular turning, but up and down, straight forward, that would be the uh, saccule and the utricle. And for static equilibrium, which means what? The standing fluid, still. yeah, when you're standing still. So the fluid in your semicircular canals only moves if you, in fact, are turning or twisting in some way. But if you're standing absolutely still, there is no fluid moving around your semicircular canals. Therefore, there's no signals being sent from them. So when you're static, when you're still, the utricle and the saccule are actually helping to maintain your upright posture, right? Because you have nothing coming back about angular changes. So we'll look at the pictures in a moment. Again, when you are stationary, that's your static equilibrium. When you are moving, that is your dynamic equilibrium. And uh, you could be moving a straight line or, or turning in, in, in uh, circles or in some sort of angle. Now, what we have in here is a macula. Now, that's a word used in many places. What does macula mean as a term? This is the vocab term in 105. Macule means a spot or a stain. You may have heard of the condition macular degeneration where individuals vision, there's a spot that gets bigger and bigger until they no longer are able to see. Here, macula means a spot or a patch or a clump of hair cells. We're back to the idea of hair cells. I hate the term, but it's the, wor the word that's used. And these hair cells are the nerve endings, right? They are the receivers of these signals. Um, there's a macula sacculi and a macula utricale. It makes sense. One's in the saccule, one's in the utricle. And these little clusters of hair cells are, again, surrounded by fluid. And they will, those hair cells will get bent. 
in the event that the fluid is moving based upon some sort of head motion. This motion is more linear, straightforward and backwards, or up and down in an elevator. Now, these hair cells, um, each hair cell has 40 to 70 little stereocilia. Again, we're in these horrible words. Okay, and I'm not going to trip you up on these words. Uh, I'm not going to ask you a, a villus versus a cilia versus a hair cell. But there are basically, um, in this little cluster, one true, quote, cilium, Borchette, kind of the kinocilium, and this is the one that's going to bend in, the one that's going to bend the most, okay? And um, this is the one that, these are the, the cells that are going to move and cause the, the depolarization or the action potential to be fired. Now, in this fluid, there are otoliths. Let's break that word down. Oto or otic means ear and lith, stone. So there are floating in this fluid some little stones, little calcium carbonate, little crystals, if you will, and um, they're floating around, and they're actually going to enhance your sense of gravity. Now, these little otoliths can become a problem in a disease called Meniere's disease. If you've heard of Meniere's disease, it's where a person is just doing fine, they're upright, and all of a sudden they have this sense of imbalance. And these otoliths are actually out of control, if you will, and they're pushing up against some of these cilia, bending them. The head's not moving, but these little stones are hitting the cilia, so now what does the person think? That they're moving, right? So all of a sudden, the world's moving, and both ears are not doing the same thing, and this person has a, you know, a horrible sense of imbalance. So that's Meniere's disease, and, and uh, we're doing some things to help with it, but it's those otoliths that are oftentimes the trouble in that disease, if you've heard of that. So taking a look at this, um, the saccule and the utricle, again, uh, they are involved with uh, static equilibrium, keeping your head straight. But when you tilt your head, right, those membranes are going to get sagged and the, the stereocilia are going to bend and you're going to stimulate some of these hair cells. Or when you're spinning, either way, right, you're going to move this fluid that is in, embedding in these, or that these cells are embedded in. So saccule and utricle, linear, semicircular canals, angular movement. You've got three semicircular canals. Uh, one is basically moving in the x-axis, one is in the y-axis, and one would be considered in the z-axis. And you know from algebra that to define a point in space, you need three coordinates, right? An up and a down, a side to side, and a front and back coordinate. And so that's what these three semicircular canals are doing. As you are moving, there's fluid moving in any or one or all of these little semicircular canals. And the ear is amazingly pulling all this data together simultaneously to give your brain two points of reference, right? Because you've got two of these sets of semicircular canals which should be responding identically, right, to the environment and sending the same signal to your head that you're moving, that you're twisting, that you're, you know, your body is, is contorted in some way. So very, very important. Now, these um, semicircular canals are much like the cochlea in that they are embedded in the temporal bone, right? So there are these spaces within the temporal bone, the temporal labyrinth, right, the maze of the temporal bone where they are in there. And then there is endolymph and perilymph, same story, right? Fluid filled chambers around these, uh, around these ducts. So again, uh, you've, let, me, let me show you in this overall picture, here are your three semicircular canals, right? One, two, and three. And in here are specific little areas, they're shown here, one, two, and three, where these hair cells are found in high number. Again, there's fluid around them, and this fluid is endolymph, endolymph. And that endolymph is going to lag behind or twist or move or bend these hair cells as one moves. So if you move in one direction, the fluid literally kind of moves in the other direction. Okay? And your brain interprets all this information into a beautiful sequence of understanding where you are. Now, I'm really not going to say a whole lot more about that, but let's figure out where are the projection pathways. 
where is vestibular information going? Okay, and I, and I hope that this will make total sense to you. So we're sitting here, right? Information is being sent from both of your vestibular apparati, right? Plural. And first order neuron, where is it going? Let's imagine this. First order neuron, if you look at it, it's going to, what would this be? Well, it's in the pons, and it's called the vestibular nuclei. Okay, again, a bunch of cell bodies, right, receiving this information. In the ear, we have the cochlear nuclei. Here, we have the vestibular nuclei. We also see some information going straight over where? To the cerebellum. Oh, that's not shocking, because we know the cerebellum is involved with motor movement and coordination, still involuntary. Right? It's, it's the kind of motor movement over which you don't have control, but it's certainly coordinating your body's movements. Then what do we see? From the vestibular nucleus, we have signals going up to the vestibular cortex. Where do you imagine the vestibular cortex is? Where are we? Basically, what, where are we? We are becoming aware of our aware, so sensory area. We're kind of up in the parietal lobe, aren't we? Okay, we're receiving this information. We're perceiving it. But you're also going to go, this information is also going to go, as we see from the vestibular nucleus, and it's going to travel up to a nuclei for eye movement. Because what is your inner ear doing for you? It's sending signals to your brain saying, hey, dummy, you're falling, you're going, you know, you're twisting. Simultaneously, you're coordinating your muscle movement, but also you're coordinating your eye movement so that you can maintain your gaze on something. And so you've got information going directly from the, from the ear to your eyes. Now, what cranial nerves are involved with the control of your eye movement? Three, ocular motor. Four, the trochlear. And six, the abducens. Right? So don't forget, three, four, and six are the three motor nerves for the eye. So this information is going to go there and help coordinate the movement of your eyes. Is that voluntary or involuntary? At this point, it's involuntary, right? Because as you're moving, that is happening for you. Right? This, all, this is all beautifully coordinated by your, by your central nervous system. Okay. So clearly information for, from your inner ear is going to go to your cerebellum. It's going to go to controlling your eye movements. It's going to go up to your thalamus and, you know, are you scared when you get on a ride and you feel like you're out of balance? So it, we, I didn't mention it, but it goes right by the thalamus. So there's our limbic system and our hippocampus and all that stuff going on. And it also, though, what we haven't seen yet is that there's also information that goes down to help with your posture. So you are now uh, controlling muscles of your leg and of your spine, your erector spinae muscles, the muscles that keep you erect. All of that's also going on so that if you are twisting, your body is able to instinctively contract or relax the muscles necessary to maintain your safety. Okay, really cool stuff. So that's the overall idea. So let me, that was the picture. Now let me just put it in words. Okay, maybe I should have done this the other way around. But again, uh, from the actual hair cells, right, the actual hair cells are gonna travel through the vestibular nerve, which is a branch of the in total eighth nerve or the vestibular cochlear nerve. And there are going to be five target areas. So let's put them in words. The first one, we're going to the cerebellum. I think that makes sense, right? We're going to the, go to the cerebellum where we're going to integrate that information, helping to control our body motion, our movement, our posture, and even some of the eye movements. We're going to go to what's called the nuclei of the ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens nerve. That's a fancy way of saying that we're going to go and inform those cranial nerves that go to control the movement of your eye. Now, this control of your eye is called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. 
Other places you'll see it just called the VOR. So the VOR is the idea that when you're walking, even though you're moving around, your eyes are able to immediately uh, change their orientation such that the thing you're looking at is staying stable. It's going to go to the reticular formation. Ah, the reticular formation is a part of your medulla oblongata that helps in, in, in within the reticular formation is where your blood circulation and your breathing, a lot of very core fundamental things are happening as part of your homeostasis. It's going to go to your spinal cord and descend. So descending tracks, things that go down the spinal cord are, are what? What kind of signals? Motor, right? And what are they going to be telling your body? To move, right? Or to, you know, adjust, right? Adjust muscles so that you don't fall over as you're being twisted or on, you're on some ride or something or just walking. And we're also going to go to the thalamus. And the thalamus will then relay that information up to our cortex, if necessary, right? Because most of our balance is done involuntarily. Most of our balance is taken care of for us beautifully without any thought, any concern at all. And so we only become aware of it, right, if we're in trouble, right? This is all happening without your consciousness. Um, now, what happens if someone, though, loses this nerve or loses this ability. Now balance becomes what? Voluntary, voluntary right? It, it becomes voluntary. And um, I'll have time maybe at some point to share with you more about my story if you don't know it. But I don't, I don't have a vestibular function, so all of my balance is voluntary. So I have to be sort of overdriving all this stuff and thinking about it um, with every step that I take. OK, so that's balance, OK? A little bit of review on structure. And now maybe some new understanding as far as these ideas of projection pathways. What is the circuitry that allows us to take information from the ear and inform our body about balance? What is the circuitry involved with taking sound waves from our ear and bringing it to the brain to make sound? What, what's the circuitry to take smell or chem chemicals from our taste buds or our nose and inform our brain? I I'm still amazed when I think about this because it's still simple old action potentials traveling down these neurons, right? So it's still amazing to me that the brain can figure out, even from the ear, right? When you think about vestibular branch coming in and cochlear branch coming in, half of what's coming into the vestibular cochlear nerve is dealing with balance, and half is dealing with sound. And still the brain can, can figure that out and, and still allow us to hear and, and maintain our balance simultaneously. So it's not like they have to take turns or you go first and I'll go. This is all happening simultaneously. Any questions on any of the senses up to vision, up to this point? Feeling comfortable? What are you going to do for this section? What's, what's the key to the senses? What do you think I'm going to tell you? No what? Uh, anatomy, a little bit, but I'm not going to, this is not anatomy, right? This is more about how it works. So you have to know your anatomy, but more focusing on what? Retelling the story, how does it work, um, which cranial nerves are involved, right? You're not going to be able to forget those. Which cranial nerves are involved, what structures are involved, and what's the pathway, right, for the brain circuitry to figure out this information. Okay, the last sense probably has the most slides. Uh, that is on vision. So let's start that conversation right now. What do we know about vision? Talk to me. It does help with balance, absolutely. Darlene? Rods and, rods and cones. We'll get to rods and cones in a minute, absolutely. So what kind of, um, let's go through our, our, our cranial nerve. Let's just jump ahead. What cranial nerve is involved with sensing light? Seeing light is all about the optic nerve number two. What else do we know? That the eye is a very complex receptor. Most of the eye is really all about protecting the sense of sight. Where, what kind of receptors are seeing light? Photoreceptors. And these photoreceptors are found where? Retina. On the retina, which is the, the back layer, if you will, the inner layer, but toward the posterior end of the eye. Everything else really is just protective, 
right? Eyelashes and all that stuff. Um, the cornea. We've got the lens that helps to focus the light. We've got some fluid in there, which is helping to bend the light so that the light images can all, what, focus as a pinpoint onto the retina. And we saw in lab that depending upon the shape of your eye, your eye may not focus things directly on the retina, giving you fuzzy vision. So we put some corrective lenses in the front, right, to, to now get the image to focus directly on the retina. And then those receptors, those photoreceptors, which Darlene said come in two types, rods and cones, and we'll get to those. They're going to send that information, perceive it, and send it through the optic nerve. And you can bet, before we're done here, we're going to talk about the projection pathway of where is that visual information going in the brain. So let's back up a little bit. What light can we see? We know that sound, we're limited. Well, we're limited in taste, right, to five basic molecules. We're limited in smell to about 50 or 60 different molecules. I don't think I said that. Um, we're limited in hearing to a frequency range of 20 up to 20,000 hertz. We're limited in our vision as well. We're limited in our vision in the idea of um, wavelength, okay? In the visual, the, 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 the human range of sight is between 400 and 750 nanometers. Now, nanometers is just, you know, a, a one, what is it, billionth of a meter. Uh, if you haven't had much physics or something, uh, it may be hard to imagine this, but we're talking about little waves, right, of light and we can read from 400 to 750. Ultraviolet would be things less than 400, ultra, right? And infrared would be, uh, or ultra above and beyond, sorry. And then uh, infrared would be things greater than 750. Now, the way this whole thing works is that there is an entire electromagnetic spectrum, you know, x-rays and infrared and ultraviolet, and we can only see in this little area that we call the visible light area. And this light's going to come in and is going to activate certain receptors. So these photoreceptors in our eye are specific to certain waves of certain, uh, 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 certain energy. So let's talk about the, the, the neural components. What's the, the nerve end of our eye? Again, the rest of it's all just structures to protect the eye or to get the image to focus on the eye. So in the back, we've got the retina. The retina is actually a, uh, an area, it branches off from your diencephalon developmentally. Remember the diencephalon is the thalamus area, the pit, the core, the center of the brain. So the retina is definitely neural tissue, right? It's nervous tissue. And um, it's attached to the eye at a very small area called the optic disc. You may have heard of someone tearing their retina, their retina detaching. The, it, it, the, the retina is only attached to a very, very small area. Some of you may even be able to recall when we did the eye dissection in 105 Lab. And we asked you in those sheep or cow eyes, whatever they were, to almost pull the retina off. And behind it was that beautiful layer, that, that, that Caribbean blue layer, right? But the retina, kind of just peeled off and was attached there just for a little bit. And that little tiny area is, is at the optic disc where the actual retina is attached. It's pushed back as a flat layer because of that vitreous humor. Remember the vitreous humor was that big ball of gelatinous jelly, clear stuff. Vitre means glass. So this is a fluid that's glassy, kind of jelly-like. So if you don't have that vitreous humor, what would happen? The retina would tend to peel off because it wouldn't be pushed up against the back of the eye. And that vitreous humor is also there to help bend the light in a short distance to allow the lights to be, light to be uh, focused onto the retina. Okay. So again, a detached retina is going to cause blurry vision and, and blindness if it is not uh, corrected. So we can look uh, at the retina with an ophthalmoscope. Has everyone here had an eye exam? Right? Dilate the eyes so that your, well, because the doctor wants to look in there with some light. If I shine light into your eye, what does, what reflexively occurs? Your pupil would go smaller, your iris, your iris goes down, so we have to sort of numb the eye, right? And uh, then when they look in, the, they can see more. 
And what they're looking at are, are, are the blood vessels of the eye. They're looking at the overall health of the eye. They're looking at the status of the retina. There are a lot of things that they're looking at. Basically, you see something that looks like this. Um, the optic disc is this area here. Now, what's right behind that optic disc? The optic disc is where all these nerve endings are coming together and merging into the optic nerve. So behind there, if you can imagine, would be the optic nerve running out the back. Now, in that area, what are there not any of? At the optic disc, there are no photoreceptors. So that's the whole basis of the blind spot that you saw, that when at a certain focal length, the images um, are going to be focused onto that part of the retina, and you can't see it, right? And we don't think about it, because as individuals with two eyes, our brain sort of fills in that blind spot. But... When you're using one eye and doing that little test, you actually get the little flash and you lose uh, images for a second. Now, there's also an area where you have more photoreceptors, okay? And that's the fovea centralis. The fovea, fovea is a term that means pit, right? Uh, and in the center, there's a pit. And in this area, there's actually a higher density of photoreceptors. So we have an area where there are more and we have an area where there are none, right, at the optic disc. And basically, uh, when you're looking through an ophthalmoscope, you're looking at all the blood vessels back here. These blood vessels need to maintain the health of the eye. And what diseases do we know can affect the blood vessels of the eye? Anybody know? What group of individuals should have yearly eye exams to make diabetics. sure there's... Yeah, diabetics, because uh, with high blood sugar, there is not only neuropathy possible to the extremities, but there's also microvascular changes that can occur to the eye, and that can lead to blindness. And so it's very, very important that those blood vessels are examined and make sure there's no evidence of rupturing. Also, people with hypertension, right, because those are capillaries, and we don't get to see capillaries anywhere else in your body directly like that. But a person with, hy with hypertension would tend to have more of those capillary beds, what? Destroyed or blown out or somehow damaged from that high pressure. So people with hypertension, people with diabetes, clearly need to be having uh, eye exams. Now, we went through the whole uh, optic disc and blind spot deal. Uh, and here's just a reminder of that. We had the circle and the X. And there was an area where you would lose, um, you would lose that uh, you stare at the, the X, and you would lose the red spot. Now, if it didn't work for you in lab, go, go back and try it. It's not critical you experienced it to understand it, but if you didn't, you had to go kind of slow, and it's not that far away from your face where it kind of just blinks. And if you're going too fast, it'll come and go so fast you won't realize it disappeared. So you'd be very slow, very deliberate, and there'll be maybe about a, a centimeter or so where that image will just kind of fade away and you won't see it. So try it again. Go back and look at the Amerman stuff, or even try it with this image. And again, the brain will fill in uh, most of that. Another area of concern, uh, not directly with the retina, but is the cataracts. Okay, anybody know anything about cataracts? Cataracts are a clouding, if you will, of the lens, and, and it starts to darken, it starts to fill up, and, and you get some debris in there. And as a result, again, light can't get through, and individuals can uh, have reduced vision. This is, again, more common in diabetics, smoking, uh, certain viruses. A lot of different things can cause cataracts. This is another reason why you, wa why you want to be wearing sunglasses, too, in the bright lights, because uh, with uh, extra UV radiation, you can also induce some of these cataracts. So over time, you know, wear, wear uh, good uh, glasses to the beach. Glaucoma is another condition you may have heard of with the eye. This is where there's an increased pressure uh, due to a, a drainage problem. So remember there's aqueous humor. Uh, aqueous humor is a, more of a watery type of fluid. It's found right behind the uh, cornea in front of the lens. It's found also back right behind the, the lens. And this fluid is constantly being formed and drained and moving around. And if there is an obstruction to this fluid movement and drainage, then the pressure can build up, leading to some rather serious 
problems with the blood vessels um, in this area, which can lead to a lack of oxygen, which leads to uh, you know, blindness or to a problem with seeing. So early symptoms are some little flashes of light, later on some halos, and uh, typically what is lost cannot be restored. Once that damage occurs, uh, that's it. So typically at an a, a optometrist, they'll do a little tomometer, tenom uh, and what that's going to do is just check the pressure. It almost feels like there's air being blown at you, right? A little air, poof, little puff of air, and they're measuring how well that air bounces back and how much pressure there is on, uh, from the aqueous humor. Okay, so how does light get into the eye? Right? Light comes in and goes where? Goes through the, even before we get to the lens, let's back up. I don't even have it on here, but first we're going to go through the cornea, right? The cornea is just that clear covering, if you will. And um, the cornea has no blood vessels, so we're not looking through blood vessels as we look out. A lot of nerve endings. Right? If you ever cut your cornea or torn your cornea, you know it's a very painful structure, but there are no blood vessels there. And then the light's going to go where? What's next? It's going to go through the pupil, and the size of the pupil, which is just the hole, is going to be controlled by a muscle called the iris, right? And we know the iris means rainbow, so it's this colored muscle of the eye. And there are muscles around the pupil which can constrict or dilate. And which one happens during sympathetic versus parasympathetic? When you are relaxed, your pupil will be smaller, right? More constricted, OK? So under parasympathetic, think rest and digest. When you're relaxed, it's going to cause a narrowing of the pupil. When you are scared, right, sympathetic, that causes your pupils to get larger. Now, you know, the bear walks in the room, yep, pupils get big. What's another way of thinking through that? Why would the eye allow more light in in a time of fear? So able to, see more of to see more, right? Uh, that bear might be coming at, the, coming at you in the dark. Whatever, right? But think of, a, think of a way, right? You want to have more light coming in. You don't want to restrict the amount of light. You don't want to restrict the amount of visual information coming in. You want to broaden, right, the amount of visual information coming into you when you're in a fight or flight response. So just, you know, make some story of this. Don't guess. Uh, just just make, something, uh, make something up if you need to. Just get the right answer. Uh, so there's two ways it happened. When would the pupils constrict or dilate? Well, we know from the pupillary reflex, reflex, right, that light intensity can have a big deal here. Last week you did a uh, little pen light, right, part of the senses lab, and we all know if you shine light in the eye, the pupil is going to go down. But also, when you are looking far and close, you don't notice this yourself, but if you were to watch your neighbor and have them reading something a foot away from their face, and then have them focus on something in the far distance, you would notice, too, that the pupils are changing in their size. And so your, your, your pupils also changing in response to focusing, right? Focusing close and far. You, I don't think you'd even see it on yourself. Maybe you could, if you're in front of a mirror. Maybe you could see it, right, looking close and then looking far away. You might be able to notice that your own pupil is changing in its size. So this is a photopupillary reflex is the constriction in response to light, okay, simple enough. And both pupils should respond together, right? So if I shine light into one eye, the other eye should also constrict. Watch any kind of cop show or medical show. Right, and you watch them, and they open the you know, lids, and they shine light in there. What are they looking for? If I shine light in, and the pupil does constrict on both sides, then I, at least I know I have a functional, what nerve is involved with pupil constriction? We got to know this one. Pupil constriction is ocular motor. 
right? So if, if you shine a light in the eye and both pupils respond to that light, at least you know that the third nerve is working, right? The ocular motor nerve is working. If one constricts and the other one doesn't, right? You've blown a pupil, right? And that tells you that there's something going on. There's been some sort of damage to the brain stem or to the something, right? There's something going on. We're going to look into it more completely. It just, it just does. The question was, why do they constrict together? They just do, okay? They just, the, the body's going to respond uni, uh, bilaterally to that. To that so um, one person, if somebody has one pupil that's dilated and the other's not, they can live like that, right? Does it? It depends on what other damage there might be. Does it restrict their vision in that one eye then? Um, it, would, it would affect their focusing because they wouldn't be able to do some of those focusing changes. Yeah, definitely would. So we're not going to make this into a physics lesson, but if you have an aquarium, right, or a big old thing of water, and you stick a stick down into it, you know that that stick appears to do what? Bend, right? So we know that light is changed, the, 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 the waves are changed, um, the, there's a bending, if you will, of the light rays. And this happens when light goes from air, through glass, through water, through aqueous versus vitreous humor. And um, the angle that it moves is referred to as refractive index. I mean, we won't worry about that. But I just want you to realize that when light comes in and goes through the cornea, right, there's a changing there. And then it goes through the aqueous humor. And there's a changing there. And then it goes through the lens. And there's a changing there. And there's a changing as it goes through the vitreous humor. And each of those layers is necessary to properly focus the light back onto the retina. So here we see light coming in, and isn't that perfect? It's perfect, right? Because what do we see? The light's coming in, and we see all the, the, the light rays are completely and perfectly focused right onto the retina. So again, it says here the aqueous humor and the lens don't necessarily alter the path of light, but there is a necessary you know, order of things to go through. Um, the lens is fine-tuning it, right? The lens becomes more round to increase the ability to see near. So the lens is going to become more round to see close. Now, what happens around age 40? The lens gets tired, right? And the lens can no longer do what we call accommodate. It can no longer make those changes. It can't round itself up enough to see things closely. And so people start having fuzzy vision clear by and you know, they're holding their menu out right at arm's length to see things because they no longer are able to make their lens change to see things up close. So the near response, okay, uh, emetropia, this is when the eye is relaxed and you're focusing on an object that's far away, 20 feet. Oh, 20 feet. That's how far away the eye chart was. Okay, so we see there's some, there's some you know, standardization here in this verbiage. So 20 feet away, about six meters away. And when that happens, when you're looking at something 20 feet away, the light rays are coming in and they're basically parallel. They're so far away that they're coming in straight into your eye. And the rays get focused without much effort onto the retina. But as you come closer, as you come closer and closer and closer, it can become more difficult, right, to keep that focus. And up to a certain point, you can keep that focus. The younger you are, likely the closer you can get to your face before you start seeing things out of focus. Now, what happens is that as we come in closer, this is what's called the near response. The eyes are going to converge. That is, the eyes are going to do what? Look like they're looking toward your nose. They're going to kind of come in together. There's going to be a constriction of the pupil. All this happens. Right? So look at somebody else. When you're reading through these notes again this weekend, just convince yourself this is real. So have somebody looking at something far away and have them continue to focus in as they get closer. And you will see their eyes are converging. You will see that their pupils are going to be getting constricted. Okay? Now what's that doing? It's helping them to focus the light on that object that's coming closer. That constriction of the pupil is actually also minimizing 
light coming in from the periphery, helping them to focus in on what's coming in. This whole change is called accommodation. So the accommodation of the lens. So you're changing the pupil, you're changing the convergence of the eyes, and you're changing the curvature of the lens. Now the muscles that are involved here are the ciliary muscles. Okay, the ciliary muscles are going to contract and that's going to make the lenses more convex. And um, at some point, you have this near point of vision. And this is something your eye doctor would be measuring. How close can you still see something, right? And they'll make, they'll make a mark of it. They'll make a note of it. And then when you go back a year later, you'll notice that it's a little different, perhaps. And at some point, um, you'll see big differences. Maybe this will help. So we're looking at an object far, far away, right? So here are your two eyes. You're looking out, and you're looking far away, more than 20 feet away. So basically, that means that the light rays are coming in pretty much shoop, straight back, right? Parallel. But as you bring a book in, right, closer and closer to your body, it's going to cause your eyes to go at an angle to converge. Your pupils are going to get smaller. And um, the light is also, notice where the light's being shown. The light is shifting, isn't it? The light is going to go from one area of the retina and go to another area of the retina. Now, as you continue to bring that book in, that light will be focused where? For a moment, that light will be focused right on the optic disc. And that's where you no longer can see that image, right? You, you, you've changed that focal point on the retina and you've moved it right on top of that optic disc area where there are no photoreceptors. And then a moment later, you keep coming closer and it reappears because you've moved past it. You're back to where there are some photoreceptors. So we, we saw this a little bit last week. Um, here, the light is um, a near response. And so again, as you, as you see it, this is looking far away. Oops. So looking far away, things are coming in pretty much straight and focusing nicely right on the fovea. The fovea is the area of the retina where there are even more photoreceptors. So it's the primo spot. It's the, it's the, it's the sweet spot of the eye to see things best. And then as you are coming in, right, uh, we'll see that the, the lens is getting more rounded. The light is coming in more at an angle, so you're having to converge your eyes. And we still get the light as long as we can accommodate it, focus nicely on the retina. But again, it has shifted just a little bit in its location. This is just a bigger picture to see that when you're looking at something up close, this is what I want you to realize, the lens becomes thicker, it rounds up. It rounds up or becomes thicker for you. And that happened because these ciliary muscles are contracting. Now what happens, how do we correct this? So if you are, and we saw this in lab, so normal vision on the far left, but what happens if your light is being focused a little bit behind the retina? What do we call that? If it's behind the retina, we call that hyperopia or farsightedness. And we learned in lab, what kind of lens do we put in front of the eye to correct for that. Yeah, convex, okay? And that's the shape that's going to correct the way or correct the light so that it will focus once again onto the retina. What kind of eyeball would more than likely be farsighted? Shorter or longer? Squished up eyeball or an elongated eyeball? It's focusing behind. So that means that the eye is not long enough. Therefore, the eye is a little bit more petite. We'll call it petite, OK? So, so there's not quite the distance, right, from the front to the back of the eye, OK? Versus, what if you have a longer eye, a more of an oblong eye? So now those rays would focus in front of the retina. And that is called nearsightedness or myopia, and to correct that, 
Again, we're not going to get into the physics of it, but to correct that, we're going to put a lens in front of it that is concave, has a cave, an indentation into the lens. If it didn't make sense, is it making sense now? Okay, and those who, and we didn't have a lot on the practical on that, so you're okay. You're not too upset. Yeah. Say that again? Are the students taking the practical tonight? Okay. Um, who's taking it tonight? Anybody? There's a couple. One, two, and all the hybrid students. Okay. $20. I think Yeah. Okay, so, so that's sort of the structure that's going on. That's the focusing the light onto the retina. And does that now make more sense? The myopia and the hyperopia, if it wasn't making sense, does it make more sense now? I hope it does. It's always good to hear a, something the second or third or fourth time. I just have one more question. When you squint your eyes, is that, that's what you're trying You're to changing the shape of the, you know, so you can, right, if you, you don't, better. yeah, you can see better. You're changing the, the, you're, you're changing the shape of the eye and or the lens so that you can focus. Yeah. Yeah, you're just squinting. Yeah, squinting. Now, what do we do? So light's coming in, and we, we already said there are photoreceptors there. So how do we get this energy, this sensory transduction, a fancy word of saying, how do light, light rays become action potentials? Right, what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to go into the retina, and again, it's the most posterior part of the retina, and back here um, is what's called the pigment epithelium. It's a layer of epithelium with what? A little bit of color. And what this does is it actually helps to absorb more light. It helps to kind of uh, minimize the scatter. So there's a layer of cells in the very, very back of the retina called the pigment cells, which are not involved with transduction of the signal, but are simply getting rid of some of that extra stray light. Back in the retina, there are these photoreceptor cells. Now, photoreceptors come in a couple different types. There are rods and cones. And we're going to see, and there's also some ganglion cells that I'm not going to talk about. But only the rods and cones are what we care about because they are the ones that are going to actually uh, receive and produce, if you will, the images to your brain. Now, in 105, I mentioned that neurons come in different shapes. There are unipolar neurons, and there are multipolar neurons. And I said that there are these things called bipolar neurons. And we never talked about them because they didn't show up anywhere really in our conversation in 105. However, the bipolar neurons are found here as a great example in the eye. So what does a bipolar neuron look like? Can you picture it? It's, it's a neuron with two poles. One is clearly a dendrite, and one is clearly an axon. Okay? So we're going to see that these are the cells. The bipolar cells are going to synapse with the rods and cones, and they are actually going to be the first order neuron. So the first order neurons are the bipolar cells. The second order neurons are going to be these ganglion cells. Okay, so we go from bipolar to ganglion cells. So let's take a look at a picture here. Again, the only cells that are going to be absorbing light are rods and cones. They are derived from the same cells within the body. The rods are not for color. The rods are for your night vision. It's more of a black and white world. Monochromatic, right? Black and white. Uh, we'll see that the, the cones in a moment are your color. Now, they get their names because of their literal shape. So if you look, Here's a rod, and there's a cone, and the cone end versus the more rod-looking end. So that's how they get their name, simple enough. And these cells have a lot of mitochondria in them. Makes, it'll make more sense in a minute. We're going to need a lot of ATP to make sight happen here in a minute. And they, of course, have a nucleus. So what you see is that there's one. This is synaptic vessels down here, so what would this be? This part would be the what? Yeah, these would be the axon, right? And all this up here would be the rod or the cone would actually be the receiving end. You might call it a dendrite. Right? So the rod or the cone end of this thing is the dendritic end. And it comes in and goes to the, ax the axon end. Now within these cells, 
um, there is a protein called rhodopsin. We'll see this in a minute. It's the pigment. It's a visual pigment. Now you see the word ops in there, vision. It ends in I-N, so it's a protein. So it's a protein somehow involved with vision. So those are the rods. Now the cones come in three types. They are your color vision. And there's red, blue, and green. Red, blue, and green. And uh, each of these cones can receive certain light of certain wavelengths. They overlap with each other. But some are more specialized for receiving red light. Some are more specialized for receiving green. Some more for blue. What if you're receiving all the colors at once? What do you see? You see white, right? So if all of the cones are being activated at the same time, that's white light. And if you're not receiving any of them, then that is darkness, right? And so in the dark, you don't see colors very well because you're not activating the red, blue, or green cones. So in the dark, your vision almost becomes black and white, doesn't it? So if it's a dark night, you don't see in color. You see shades of gray, but you don't see color um, at nighttime. Okay, so let's take a look at the layers of the retina. Figure this out. So light is coming in. Light is coming in. Here's the back of the eye. And light's coming in this way, right? Now let's take a look. There's the sclera. We're way in the back, right? There's the sclera, the white of the eye. And then here's the choroid, right? The outer layer and the middle layer. And then there is, I told you in the very, very back, there was this layer right there. I'll make it even darker. That layer is the pigment epithelium. In other words, light comes in and goes straight to the back. And that pigment does what again? It sort of scatters, it picks up scattered light and helps to focus the light more specifically. So it's interesting. The light goes all the way to the back of the eye, and then it comes back, and the rods and cones are now more, what should we say, um, are closer right to the source of light. So light goes right by the rods and cones on the way in, hits that pigment epithelium, gets rid of any scattered light, and then starts communicating backwards, and it goes to the rods and the cones, then to the bipolars, and then to the ganglion. Boom, boom, boom. So the rods and cones, then the bipolar cells, and then the ganglion cells. And then you see that the ganglion cells are going to all merge together to help make the optic nerve. So that's the sequence. So again, over here in words, right? First to the pigment epithelium, then to the rods and cones. The rods and cones are then going to synapse on the bipolars which are then going to synapse on the ganglion. So here's a cartoon of it. I think this is easier to see. So light is coming in from the front. It goes straight back and hits the what? The pigment epithelium. Gets rid of any scattering of light, helps to focus in. And then back here, there are some rods. Sorry, there's some cones. Here are some rods. They're being activated. They're then going to speak to what? They're going to speak to the bipolar cells. And then the bipolar cells are going to speak to the ganglion cells, which themselves become part of the nerve, right, the second nerve. You have about 130 million or so rods and 6.5 million cones. So you have a lot more, what, a lot more photoreceptors for black and white than you do for color. And about 1.2 million nerve fibers in the optic nerve. So what does that word nerve fiber mean? There's still some students that are either knowingly or unknowingly using that word inappropriately. What is nerve fiber? A nerve fiber is an axon. Keep it simple. A nerve fiber is an axon. So what a bundle of nerve fibers, a bundle of axons is a nerve. There we go. Okay. So I've still got people using that word, I think, inappropriate. In, in, they're using it wrong. A, a few of you uh, on the lab practical or in other verbiage, I've seen it wrong. So again, you have about 1.2 million nerve fibers within the optic nerve. Okay, Axons wrapped together to make the optic nerve. Now, there's a lot of convergence here. What does that mean? Neuronal convergence. You've got all this information coming in and converging 
into a more limited number of spots. And so you've got multiple rods and cones synapsing onto one bipolar. And you have multiple bipolars then synapsing onto a ganglion, right? So you're, you're converging the signals coming in to a fewer and fewer cells. This is a picture from Anatomy and Physiology Revealed. You'll recognize the black background. Nothing fancy here. Um, I do believe, though, that the coloring is backwards as I look at this. And do you agree that this, and let me change color so you can see it, that ain't no cone. And that ain't no rod. So they, this is reversed, OK? So the gray is the proper color, OK? So the cones are clearly these guys down here, OK? And the rods are these big guys. I'm not sure how they happen, but clearly they're backwards. So I told you that there's this protein called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is going to be important for us. It is a, uh, it, if you looked at a bucket of rhodopsin from Walmart, it's going to be sort of a reddish purple color. So that's where it gets its name, rhodo, right, red. So it's a red, ver visually kind of purple uh, protein. And um, there's two parts to this rhodopsin. There is a portion called opsin. Okay, so we see the kind of a, oop, we see the, the name here. So there's the opsin portion and there's a retinal portion. Well, have you been told that carrots are good for your night vision? Right, eating carrots are good for your night vision because carrots contain vitamin A. And vitamin A, one of the things derived from vitamin A is this retinol molecule. So absolutely, by eating carrots, you are actually feeding your body the necessary precursors to make more rhodopsin. So grandma was right, eat your carrots. Now rhodopsin um, has a maximum wavelength of 500, but it can't tell the difference. So in other words, rods only tell black and white. They, they can't tell red from blue from green. So they are monochromatic, they are uh, activated most at 500 nanometers, but they can't tell one color from the other. Versus cones. Cones have a protein called photoopsin. Not hard to imagine, right? So rhodopsin was on the rods, easy enough. And the photoopsin is the color, photo. And um, the retinol section is the same, so you still need vitamin A, right, to make part of the uh, photopsin molecule. And the opsin is a little bit different, and it's the opsin portion that changes if it's specific to red or green or blue light. So three kinds of cones. You can't pick them out. They all look alike. They all have slightly different chemicals in them that allow them to absorb different wavelengths to produce our color vision. So how does this work? I think this is going to blow your mind a little bit. It blows mine every time I think about it. Because what I'm about to tell you seems completely backwards. It's going to seem completely backwards to you. So hang in there as we go through this. In the dark, well, first of all, what would you imagine? Just talk to me. If you're thinking about photoreceptors, you would imagine that light coming into the eye would cause what? Light coming into the eye must somehow cause an activation and therefore a release of something that causes a depolarizing event that causes an action and potential to be sent, right? Would you agree that light coming in must somehow activate something? No. Oh, no, 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 no. No, the good Lord didn't make us that way. So in the dark, the rods are constantly releasing neurotransmitter. In the dark. When they're not doing anything, they're constantly releasing neurotransmitter. Well, now you understand why these cells need so many mitochondria and why they also need a lot of oxygen, right? These are highly metabolic cells. They need a lot of energy to keep doing this. They have to keep making neurotransmitter and releasing it when there is no light, okay? So what's happening is that the rods are steadily releasing neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is glutamate, OK? 
Okay? That's the neurotransmitter of choice here that these cells release constantly. Now, when the rods absorb light, when light comes in, glutamate stops. Right? I would expect light to turn something on. Instead, light actually turns something off. So now the glutamate's no longer released. Those bipolar cells, where were they? They were the next cell in line, right? Those bipolar cells are sensitive to these on and off pulses of the glutamate. Some bipolar cells are inhibited and excited when the secretion stops. Okay, so when the bipolar cells no longer are getting glutamate, they get what? They get turned on. Okay, there's just a, a little quirky thing in here. So at rest, neurotransmitters are being released, glutamate. When light comes in to the rods, that glutamate stops. The bipolar cell says, oh, but for some reason, when the bipolar cell no longer gets glutamate, it becomes excited, okay? But other bipolar cells are reversed. So it's kind of a hodgepodge here. And what we're going to see is that this is going to have a lot to do with light intensity. So as light intensity drops, some will become excited more than others. Hang on to that. Let's take a look at this picture. I know it's kind of small. Um, so light, oops, hit the wrong thing again. So here we are in the dark. And in the dark, this molecule is constantly releasing neurotransmitters. But in the light, as light comes in, the rhodopsin is going to absorb this light. That's the molecule that absorbs the light. And it changes the molecule such that it no longer, it breaks the current. It's no longer going to release the signals. And it turns out that that is now going to activate the bipolar cells. Now, in lab, we mentioned negative afterimage. Negative afterimage was sometimes also called photo bleaching. And the idea is you are looking at something, and when you look away from it, for a short while thereafter, you can no longer, those receptors can no longer be used. So you look at a really, really bright light, and it basically does what to you? It blinds you. It, it's, it's bleaching or over-stimulating the cells coming in, and it takes a while for you to respond to that. So... Um, takes, you know, it can take about five minutes to, can take up to five minutes, lost it. Five minutes to, to regenerate. So if you really stare at something for a long time, you can, you can be seeing spots or not seeing things for quite a while. I'm not going to get into this cis and trans bent and straight portion, okay? Um, I'm just going to kind of skim over that, so don't get caught up on that. Um, shape of the rhodopsin in this conversation. It's just more than what I want to deal with. But look at this picture. I think this is where I do want you to look. Focus on this conversation. So in the dark, here's my rod cell. I see the rod at the top. And during the dark, it is going to continue to release neurotransmitters. Okay, you can see little dots right there. So the neurotransmitters are being released onto the polar, onto the bipolar cell. Now, when these are being released, the bipolar cell is not doing anything. So basically, the release of neurotransmitters, the release of glutamate from the rod shuts off the bipolar cell. And so nothing's going on. Nothing's going beyond it. So your optic nerve perceives what? Nothing, right? But in the presence of light, in the presence of light, It stops, right? There's nothing happening here. You see nothing happening there. No neurotransmitters released, no glutamate. Well, that lack of glutamate actually turns on the bipolar cell, and it begins to release neurotransmitters. Okay, and those neurotransmitters are then received by the ganglion cell, which now is sending action potentials down the optic nerve. Now, 
these little lines down here, I know it's really, really small. What do those little lines mean to you? Anything? Can you see them? It's showing just a bunch of lines really, really in close proximity. What if it said this instead? What does the top picture versus the bottom picture suggest? Yeah, how fast or how frequently the action potentials are being sent. And so if there was a bright light, you would have what? More frequent signals. And if there was a dimmer light, there would be fewer. OK. And then all that information is coalescing or converging onto the optic nerve. So I've already mentioned this. OK, so when the bipolar cells detect those fluctuations, they can stimulate the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are the only cells that actually produce the action potential. OK, so the rods, the cones, the bipolar cells, they're just kind of intermediates. They're, they're, they're dealing with the signaling. But it's the ganglion cell that actually fires the action potential. And off they go down the optic nerve going to the brain. So how do we ad adapt to this light change? So light and dark adaptation. So we walk out into the sunlight. We know what happens. Talk to me. It hurts, right? Why? Because immediately, what's going to happen? Just like flashing light into your eye, your pupils are going to constrict. You're overstimulating the retina, so you're like, wow, this is really bright, right? You're closing your eyes. You're blinded, if you will, for a moment. It literally hurts, right? Bright light. Uh, the pupils are going to restrict to reduce that pain and reduce the intensity. And for a while, you're not going to see the same. Um, you're not going to see color the same. Your, your acuity will be down when you first walk out into bright light. It takes a while for you to adapt, doesn't it? Okay. Now, what's happening here is it's going to take time for bleaching, or that is for the sensitivity of the retina to adjust to that higher brightness. And during this time, your rods are just being over, overworked. So you're going to have some difficulty seeing some things. Now, what happens when you walk into the dark? All of a sudden, the lights go off. Kind of reverse it, right? We know this. The pupils are going to dilate. The rod pigment was already bleached by the light. In other words, there was already light coming in. So we're going to say those were bleached. And so in a moment, do you all agree if you go into a dark room that at first you see nothing? And then you become more sensitive, if you will, and now you can begin to see things that you couldn't see? It takes a couple minutes for that process to roll over. So pretty soon you'll be into a night vision. And then after 20 or 30 minutes, you'll be at the maximum sensitivity. I mean, this is why kids scream, right, when you turn the lights off. Because immediately, they see nothing. And then, OK, you know, if they'll kind of relax a little bit, now they can see a little bit. They can see their dresser a little bit, right? And after 20 or 30 minutes in the dark, you actually have maximum vision back in the dark. Dan? So when people have photo sensitivity, mm -hmm. does that just mean they, they're not overactive? It can be. I mean, some. There are individuals who have uh, different sensitivities to senses. I mean, it, some children, some people are more sensitive to light. Some people are more hypersensitive to sound or to smell or to taste. Or, so we all know that our brains wire differently. And some people are just really, really sensitive to different senses, uh, maybe to the point where it's abnormal, right, where it's in, affecting their life and they no longer will avoid places or avoid things. Um, some kids with some level of autism will be super sensitive to some stimuli that's certainly outside of normal, right? And, and so they become aware of it, and the family around them tries to minimize those potential situations so that they don't have those overstimulated over moments. Why, when you have a concussion, are you more sensitive to light? Why, when you have a concussion, are you more sensitive to light? I'm imagining, off the top of my head, that you have damaged or slowed down the response of the third nerve. And so your pupillary reflex is not as rapid as it should be. Are all concussions that way or just some? I don't know. I'm learning here as we speak. So some concussions can have problems with light sensitivity, right? People see halos, some of that kind of stuff. Um, 
I'm going to I'm going to just go out on a limb and say it has something to do with a temporary disturbance to the nerves here, right? Or part of the brain that are controlling these these involuntary responses. So we've got uh, rods and cones. I'm sorry. Question. You you get up quickly and you see stars. Blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, my first guess there is that you've stood up and your body didn't adjust this blood pressure well enough, and for a moment your brain wasn't happy. Right. And so you're you're going to see some faintness or maybe some visual things that aren't quite right. Let's do this. Uh, let's take a break here, and we'll come back and finish up. You can have a couple more questions as well. So let's pick up this conversation on vision. Let's figure this out. So we've got rods and cones. What, do you, what questions do you have? I've got a couple more slides coming up that are going to help you, I think, make more sense of this. But what do we know? Um, order of light rays comes through, goes back to the retina, and goes first to a layer called the pigment epithelium, right? And then that's going to help pick up any stray light rays, and then you're going to activate what? The rods or the cones, depending on what kind of light it is. And the rods and cones are then going to speak to the bipolar cells, who are then going to speak to the ganglion cells, which then make up part of the optic nerve. So rods are sensitive even in dim light. So in very low light, we can see black and white. Right? We see in black and white. We don't see, though, very good. Um, color at all in the dimness. And, and here's why. There's a lot, of converge, a lot of convergence. So the rods converge onto one bipolar cell. I've already told you there's lots of divergence here. And so um, we, can, we can get just a little bit of light and see reasonably well. Now the other thing that, don't forget that light is not only, or the optic nerve is not only receiving light or allowing us to see light. Sorry. But what else is the optic nerve allowing us to do? I can see, but I also can see shadows. I can also see movement. I may not be able to focus on what's happening over here, but I can see my hand moving, right? So you have this little bit of peripheral vision. You can't focus on it well. You can't really see it perfectly well unless you look at it and gaze. But we certainly have, in our periphery, the ability to basically have motion detectors, right? So we can perceive motion or, or shadows or moving objects in our periphery. We can't see them in fine detail, right? But we know that they flash by. So that all makes sense uh, in the retina. Now, let's go to the fovea. The fovea is the area that is... A, a, a large number of cones, um, no rods in this area, and there's no convergence here. So this area is called the private line to the brain. This is where each little cell kind of directly goes to the brain. This is the area of your highest color resolution. So this is that sweet spot, right? This is the sweet spot on your retina for color vision. Uh, very little summation, not very sensitive to light, to dim light though. And so this is an area of great visual acuity, color sensitivity, but only in good light. As light gets dimmer, we don't see the colors as well. Bringing us back to this idea of three cones. I mentioned to you that our cones, uh, red, blue, and green, pick up different wavelengths. And I never showed you a picture of that spectrum. So, from about 400 up to about 750 or so um, nanometers. And we all know Roy G. Biv, right? Roy G. Biv, the colors of the rainbow. And that's really what this thing is, but it's backwards, right? So Roy from red all the way down to violet. And the red cones are able to see light in this area. So it's red. So light that comes in of a certain uh, nanometer wavelength, somewhere around 480 or so, all the way up to 700, will activate the red cones. Light that comes in that is <coughs> a little bit in the middle, 
will activate the green cones, and then we see that the blue cones are activated down here. Again, when all of the cones are activated simultaneously, we perceive white, and any combination thereof allows us to see the millions of colors of the rainbow. It's just like the three ink cartridges, right? In your, your cyan, yellow, and magenta ink cartridges allow you to make millions of colors, so too our eyes can perceive all the colors through these three different cones. The black, right, the rods right there in the center, 500. I told you that the rods were, they're not, mon they're, they're monochromatic. They can't perceive different lights, but they are activated right at about 500 maximally. Now here I've got them marked as S, M, and L, simply meaning short, medium, and long wavelength. So the red one is the long. and the short one is blue. So if we keep going down this way, what are we going to have? Ultra violet, and this way we would have infrared. Now we can't see in the ultraviolet or infrared spectra, but animals can, right? And we, we know that, for example, some insects can see in the infrared or the ultraviolet, so they can see things we can't see. Right? They can perceive things that we can't see because their cones allow them to see outside of our visual spectrum. So again, your perception of color comes from mixing of these three different cones. Now what if, for whatever reason, a genetic problem, you don't make a certain one of these cones? If you don't have the red sensitivity, then you would have one type of <laughs> color blindness, and so all of your colors would be perceived without any red in it at all. So you're going to see things more looking bluish and greenish. And for each of these, there are different combinations of color blindness, some being a bigger problem than others. So the most common is red green color blindness. And this is from a lack of either one or the other, the L or the M. So what are those? The L or the M are what? Long, Long and medium, which would be what? Red and green, right? So you're missing one or the other. And this is going to have having difficulties with shading and, and seeing things. Again, you're lacking one of the three molecules, right? Phytopsin was the uh, molecule that received the light. So if you, if you don't have the gene, you can't make the protein. So you've got a mutation. And <coughs> this is much greater issue in males, at least the most common type is because this is a X-linked trait. We won't get into the genetics of that, but it's more common for males to have this kind of color blindness. Females, much less common. Other types of color blindness are not necessarily X-linked or sex-linked. So a person with, with red, blue, or sorry, red, green color blindness would not be able to see what's embedded in here. What do you see embedded in here? A mirror image of 19. Yeah, it's kind of a funky looking upside down, 16, 19 something, right? Can anybody see that? But if you didn't have, uh, it is definitely oddly upside down. You wouldn't be able to see that. It threw me off with the black and white image on here. I was like, what? Yeah, oh, yeah, you're all colorblind if you look on your black and white image, right? You can't see a thing, right? Okay, you can't distinguish it at all, can you? Um, now, we've also got issues with um, depth perception, right? Some people have a greater problem with depth perception. They can't uh, overlap their eyes very well. Some people have difficulty with microscopes because they, they, their eyes just uh, have a difficulty with this. Or maybe uh, with aging, some people can't perceive depth very well. They can't see that the car is 100 feet away or 10 feet away, that kind of thing, in the worst case scenario. And then other individuals have a greater or lesser panoramic vision. We have a limited peripheral vision. Some animals uh, have more, and some individuals, too, would have more. Look at where eyes are shaped on animals, right? Where are horses' eyes? They're on the side, right? So they have this tremendous panoramic view, if you will. They can't see right in front of them necessarily very well, but they can see around, uh, around the outside the most. Yeah, right. They, yeah, you're right. If you look at their pupil, it looks more slit-like, doesn't it? So they have a, that helps to increase their, their distance. Now, another idea here is fixation point, and that is a point where... Uh, the point where you are focusing. So again, if you're looking at something 100 feet away versus if you're looking at something close, you know that your eyes are at a different angle 
And um, that's really all I want you to realize is that that movement or that placement of your eye also tells your brain how far away the object is. Let me say that again. So you know if you're looking at something far away, your eyes are more parallel. And as you bring the object in, your eyes converge more. So as your eyes are doing that, that's also sending a signal to your brain saying, oh, the thing that you're looking at is far away or is, is closer. And some individuals have difficulty with that. Uh, there's just a crisscross going on in their nervous system. So again, we saw this a little bit earlier. If you're looking at a distant object, your eyes are going to be more straight. And as you look closer in, your eyes are going to convert. But your, your two eyes are receiving information, so you see in stereo, don't you? You hear in stereo with two ears, you see in stereo or in bi, bi stereo vision. Okay, the last thing we need to work on, the last 10 minutes is simply what is the visual projection pathway? Where does this information start? We know where it starts, right, in the retina, goes through the optic nerve. Where is it going in the brain? What is the pathway for vision? So we've already been through this. The first order neurons are the what? The first order, the, the cells that were activated were the what? Rods or cones. But the first order neuron is actually the bipolar cells. Now, because they're the first ones to receive the neurotransmitters, okay? And then the ganglion cells are the second order. The second order neurons are the ones that form the optic nerve. Now, the optic nerve does something that I think we've all seen, and that is it has this huge crossing over. If you turn the brain upside down, you'll see this big structure. It's called the optic chiasm. And chi, C-H-I, is the Greek, or this, I should say, is the Greek letter chi. Looks like an X, right? It's a crossing over. So the chiasm. And uh, not all the fibers are going to decussate. Okay, you might think at first, oh, everything from the right eye is going to the left brain. Everything from the left eye is going to the right brain. No, it's only about 50-50. So we would say that it's hemidecusation. Only about half of the fibers are actually going to cross over. And once we cross, now the optic nerve goes into the brain, so now it's called the optic tract, right? So the nerve becomes a tract. When it leaves the periphery and goes into the central, it's now the optic tract. So that means that some of the information from the right eye is going, staying on the right side of the brain, and some of it's going over to the left. So it's about 50-50. Now the optic tract is going to pass around the hypothalamus and go to the geniculate nucleus, the lateral geniculate nucleus. And this is going to the thalamus. So this is the area of the thalamus. Okay, and then the third order neuron is now going to carry it from the thalamus and it's going to go to all sorts of places within the cerebrum. That's why it's called optic radiation. Not like radioactive radiation, but what else does radiation mean? Radial, to spread out, right? And so the radiation here, we're going to see that there are lots of areas of the brain that are going to receive visual information, this optic radiation. The primary place, we already know. We, we, we look at the occipital lobe, and we, the first thing that comes to mind is the occipital lobe is the place where we have the visual cortex. But we're also going to see that some fibers, again, what's that word nerve fiber mean? Some axons within the tract, right, are going to go to the midbrain. And there they're going to go to what's called the superior colliculi and the pretectal nuclei. I'm not going to worry about the, what those areas are, but this is where we control our visual reflexes okay. and the accommodation, the, pupil, the pupillary reflexes. So let's just take a look at this image and appreciate this. So the light's coming in, going back to the retina. Oops. It's going back to the retina, and we're going to see that some of the fibers decussate, and some of the fibers do not. So if there's any decussation, some of them are going to cross over at the chiasm, some are not. 
And then what are these areas? Well, back in here, we see that the primary rate place, things go back to the occipital lobe. We're not surprised by that. But there's also stopping off or information being sent to this pretectal nucleus and the lateral geniculate nucleus. And just appreciate that those are areas where you're going to be controlling pupillary reflexes and also controlling accommodation, your ability to focus. Where else would this visual information be going? Where else? Cerebellum. Yeah, do you think vision is going to inform your balance, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to see here in a moment that, yes, we're going to have those are being the primary places where light's going to go. Is light going to go by your limbic system and inform your memory ability in the hippocampus and the amygdala? You better believe it, right? So again, that's kind of common in all these situations. Information from the light is going to go in and inform all those things. Now, as far as other things, light is going to go in. Why would light be going to the temporal lobe? Why would light be going to the temporal lobe? Maybe. I'm, I'm trying to go back. I told you that recognition of faces was in the temporal lobe, right? So we have to see someone's, we have to see to see someone's face, and part of that recognition was in the temporal lobe. Um, the ability for you to, to um, have memories, to remember things, is also partially in the parietal and temporal lobes. It also makes sense that light is coming in as a sensation, right? So we're sensing that in the parietal lobe. So a lot of things are, are your vision is informing your brain in so many, many places. And that brings us to the end, right? Now, what are you going to do? I've got five minutes to start chapter 15, right? No, I, I'm not going to go on. But what it, let, me just, let me just give you a, a heads up, though. So next Tuesday, come together, 4 o'clock exam. Those who are, who are in hybrid, um, just know that tonight in lab I'll be talking to you about uh, getting your exam in the testing center or taking it with us. The exam will be next Tuesday, 4 o'clock. It'll be in the blue and gold room, so we have more room to spread out and make room for the hybrid students who are choosing to take it with us. The exam, again, water balance. It's been a while. Right, water balance and the brain and the senses. Now, there are three quizzes associated with this. And last night, I was still a little bit concerned as to how many people had not even started the quiz. Now, some people have already done them and submitted. Some people are in the active. I, I know the moment you click on it, I can see that you are actively involved. But the over half the class had not even started them. Now, keep in mind, these quizzes are not timed. You can go into them, explore things, come and go, open book, open resource, and they're due when? Sunday night. So please, 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 those who have not started any of them, don't wait till Saturday to do all three of them. I beg you, do one today and tomorrow. Do, spread it out over the next three days. Once we get to Sunday night at 11.59, it's over. And at 12.01 a.m. Monday morning, the quizzes become reviewable. And you can see the answers and what you did right or wrong. If you never start the quiz, you don't get to play the game. My point is this. If you never start the quiz, you won't get to review your answers because you didn't have any answers. So you must have at least started them to play the game. Now, if you get to Sunday night at 11.50 and say, oh, shoot, I haven't started these, at least click on them. You're not going to get a good score, but at least you'll have the benefit of reviewing them. Okay, so make sure you at least, I would go in right now and click on all three, get them started. So that at least you know that Sunday night, Monday morning, you'll be able to review if you don't have time to go back and finish them. But I assure you that by doing the quizzes, you will be better prepared for the exam. So number one, do your connect assignments. Don't forget about those. In order, I would do the connect assignments. 
if there's things you're not understanding in the Connect assignments, then my recommendation is go back and listen to the lecture again. <laughs> then go back and take the quiz. And if something's not making sense in the quiz, it's open book, open resource. It's not like you have to know it within an hour. Do as best you can on those and then review those early next week um, as you're preparing for the exam. There are the guided readings as well. The guided readings have a lot of information, but I'm telling you right now, there's only one short answer question, and that one short answer question is going to be about action potentials. So again, make sure you can sketch out an action potential, describe to me what that depolarizing and repolarizing is all about, what gates are open, what channels are open, know the numbers, the negative 70, the negative 55, the positive 35, know what local versus action potentials are, know what EPSPs versus IPSPs are, and know the significance of what's going on at the axon hillock. So I'm basically telling you the pieces of the short answer question right there. That question will be worth 15 points. Because I'm giving you the question right now in advance, I expect you to have a thorough and complete answer, right? not a half-baked answer. So I'll be tough on the grading on those because I'm telling you what to expect. Write out an action potential, describe it to me, have the numbers, Tell me what's going on with local versus action potentials. Tell me about EPSP, IPSPs, and what's going on at the Axon, Axon Hillock. So if you can verbalize all that in a short answer. Would you rather I sent that question to you? Yes. yes. I will post, I will send out an announcement with the exact question so that there is even less excuse for you not to have a beautiful answer on your test. Okay? Okay, guys, I will see you. Have a beautiful weekend. It's supposed to be a nice one. Thank you.